Welcome to the Boardroom Series. I'm Dr. Roland Roberts, former CEO of the Hoverboard Company and advisor to national governments on cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. And we are here uh, at the Boardroom Series today to talk about emerging cybersecurity technology and how it impacts corporate strategy. I'm joined by Sean Canuck. Sean was the first national intelligence officer for cyber issues for the United States. Uh, was appointed in 2011 and uh, did that for a number of years and uh, has since founded uh, Exadec, and we'll hear about that here in just a moment. But uh, he was also uh, an, an intelligence fellow for the National Security Council and was a, a CIA officer uh, in relating to cyber issues. So, Sean, thank you for being with me today to talk about uh, cybersecurity and the world that we live in. So give us a little bit, uh, a snapshot of what you've been involved in, in especially with Exadec, since leaving government work. Well, certainly. First off, thank you for uh, inviting me to join today. Looking forward to our discussion. Since I finished my government service in 2016, I've spent a fair amount of time in public interest projects like the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. I've done work in academia with Stanford and then teaching at the George Washington University on the security implications of artificial intelligence. But my professional focus at this point is founding the global consultancy, Exadec, where we seek to bring that body of knowledge from the national security experience and the other executive work we do into corporate boardrooms and C-suites, particularly for a lot of small and medium-sized businesses who might not be able to hire their own cadre of world-class executives in their C-suite for chief technology officers and CISOs. Right. Well, so let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, there's a, a lot of consultants out there. So True. whenever you talk about consultancies and so forth, and even around in, in the world of cybersecurity. So uh, obviously, outside of your unbelievable experience uh, as one of the most qualified individuals in the world to speak or work on cyber issues, security issues, uh, what else sets um, Exadec ap ap apart? Like why, why, like as a CEO of the Hoverboard Company, and I'm, and I'm looking at how do I, you know, protect our technology or what have you, uh, why would I have wanted to bring Exadec in? Especially if I have an IT department or what have you. A absolutely. I mean, in a nutshell, our job is to keep companies in the black and corporate executives out of jail. Right? It's a very competitive marketplace, as you say, in the consulting and the IT industry. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the differentiators for Exadec is the experience and specialization of the strategists that we bring in our group. And I'll mm -hmm. talk about that in a second. And secondly, the nature of our engagements. Uh, on the former, you have lots of law firms, consulting firms, uh, auditors, right. and we work with some of those, right? Uh, they may provide you the additional staff you need. They may have a cadre of MBAs who can apply certain templates to working on your management problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but they may not have the kind of individuals we have who have served in roles like my own or have been executives in tech companies who have written the legislation in various countries where you may be seeking to do international business. We may have people out there worried about GDPR or CCPA. Mm -hmm. Well. We probably have a very keen understanding of the legislative history as well as the judicial enforcement of those that is or will be going on. So I think we bring a depth of expertise. A lot of our folks are professors who are at the pinnacle of teaching these issues to the next generation of professionals. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the second point of the nature of our engagements. Our purpose, we think, is to be forward-looking, predictive analysis to help maximize that return on investment. We seek to... Uh, enable companies and executives to properly assess and manage digital risk, to predict and leverage the emerging technologies that will affect their industry in the future, and in essence, to help them capitalize on the value of the information in their enterprise. And that's no easy task currently. There's a lot of competition out there, and the companies that don't adopt some of these technologies properly will be left behind in the future. Well, you said one thing that got my attention. Uh, you, you mentioned... Uh, that, you know, to help keep executives out of jail. And so, obviously, if I'm so you know, listening to this, I'm saying, you know, light bulbs are going off. What, well, how in the world am I even at risk of going to jail? Our friends in the United Kingdom are probably a little more attuned to that than others. Uh, certainly, the new legislation in the UK, which has civil and criminal penalties, mm -hmm. implies that directors and officers whose companies suffer a data breach could face personal uh well, they're civil Pure and criminal. criminal right? Civil and I mean, criminal. It, 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 yeah. And, of course, that goes beyond just the disgorgement of profits or the loss of reputation or profitability of your company. So mm -hmm. it really is getting personal. 
Uh, I'm doing a lot of work with uh, groups discussing the standard, proper standard of care for director and officer liability, a nonprofit project in that case that's supported widely by the regulatory community and the insurance community who are worried about all these kind of litigation. Right. Well, see, it, it, and that's huge because one of the challenges that CEOs and business executives have had is for the last, you know, 15, 20 years, we st- we bought the, the cybersecurity software, the antiviruses and, yeah. and things, and we were told that that was our answer and solution. But yet, as you know, most every one of us have been compromised, uh, of certainly our data, um, at, at, at any point. And, and so it hasn't worked. So whenever you bring a solution that, that is an expensive solution to, uh, you know, or you add in technology costs plus consultancy costs and so forth, uh, I, I'm trying to create the, uh, and find the value of why, why invest in cybersecurity? Why should I, whenever I'm worried on a Sunday afternoon here, I'm worried tomorrow morning about selling my product. I'm worried yep. about the retail industry that I've got to compete with, uh, my other competitors, the manufacturing issues that I have in the supp- problems in the supply chain. I'm thinking of all of the commercial side. I'm not even watching my six here, you know, the, the flanking maneuvers that could completely take me down, such as a, a cyber issue. So I would, you know, succinctly say we're here to support the CSO. Most people think I'm saying chief security officer. I'm saying the chief strategy officer and mm-hmm. then the CEO and the board because all of this concern we're talking about has to be a part of your corporate strategy. The same way if you're a financial institution, credit swaps and interest loan rates matter for your business. Hmm. Cybersecurity is increasingly mattering for any business that deals with data and even companies that don't. We'll come back to that later. But, you know, you asked, well, what about all these solutions that are out there available? Yeah, and there are other consultants who can help you pick a firewall or an IT architecture. That's important. It's as important as putting a lock on your door. Right. But I personally don't think the lock I have on my front door is going to keep out foreign military intelligence organizations, right, right. international organized narco-trafficking regimes, right? Mm-hmm. You have to go beyond that. You have to look at your strategic posture of your organization, have the depth of threat analysis to know where you might be at risk, and how to hedge and manage that risk. Now, I hope you don't know how to do that, and I hope a lot of others don't, because what it takes is actually being in the mind of your adversary, knowing how people who are there to break the law, commit crimes, break infrastructure like energy grids and transportation networks, how they go about it. Mm-hmm. And that's back to the specialization of our strategists. We have folks who've been in sensitive government and law enforcement roles in a number of countries, and they understand how targeting and cyber operations happen. They have detected and curtailed disinformation operations in numbers of countries and uh, areas. So if you don't understand how the other side thinks, which again, most companies shouldn't be doing that because it's illegal, Mm. uh, you can't properly prepare. I need a lock on my front door. You should have a firewall. You should have an intrusion detection system. It should be dynamic. I offer that is not going to distinguish you and make you the most profitable in your industry. That alone. Okay. And so speaking of profitability, speaking of profit, because that's what a lot of it always boils down to uh, in in a business. Um, what are what are the numbers? Why, what are the metrics of why do I care as a business owner? I, I hear what you're saying. I obviously see the need, and we have these technologies and the firewalls and, and, and the intrusion detection, and we have some of these the, these you know peripheral technologies. However, uh, and I don't think that my business is is necessarily we're not carrying super sensitive data. Like I'm not carrying government secrets, and you know we're building widgets over here, right? So who cares really if somebody not who cares, but you know, if somebody hacks in or, or takes the data, it's not earth shattering. So, uh, but really understanding the kind of the digital, the, the, the idea of digital neighbors and why, yeah. how, why do I care as a business uh, that even if my data isn't that incredibly valuable, perhaps, uh, or, but, but, but a neighboring or someone, another company in my supply chain, you know, if they are hacked, how it does impact me. Yeah, a- absolutely. I- you know, there's a range of different uh, direct and indirect threats that entities can face. Certainly, if you're in a sensitive technology field or if you're in the healthcare industry, you know, you may be the intentional target of activity. And we've unfortunately seen that already in a number of areas. Financial institutions. Uh, Several target. thousand attacks per hour Absolutely. on financial institutions. Denial of service attacks. Yeah. You've seen ransomware against hospitals, right? Yes. yes. Uh, so you clearly have entities that are the targets themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And they need to figure out. Uh, with the aid of experts, uh, mm-hmm. the right defensive posture and the right other activities to hedge that risk. 
Now then you also have others who may not be in the political crosshairs or in the primary cr criminal crosshairs, but could be collateral damage of other activities. There's no shortage of cyber events that were aimed at one entity and then were either leveraged to compromise another. Actually, the retailer Target suffered that way. A trusted business partner of theirs was actually the infection vector. Mm -hmm. Third party been compromised, and then the uh, compromise moved to Target and ultimately compromised the uh, customer data. So it's not, sometimes it's not even, are my systems secure enough? It's what are the systems of all the people that I'm working with down the, down Absolutely. the data Absolutely, in your vertical yeah. and horizontal supply chains. And you may not be thinking about it already, but I can assure you that your adversaries are. They look for the path of least resistance in. And unfortunately, offenders, <laughs> once they're in, they can usually maintain access and move laterally and otherwise throughout networks into your trusted partners. Defenders have to be perfect everywhere all the time. So it's really at a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're really talking about offensive uh, and defensive strategies. And really, you have to have both right? yeah. as a company. I mean, the two are their opposite sides of the same coin. You have to understand the other side to be able to do either well. And you talked about this idea of virtual neighbors. We've discussed it before. Yes. I think that's really critical because let's imagine you are a bakery or a small e commerce site, someone who doesn't imagine themselves in the mix of things. Yeah. Well, are you possibly have the same telecommunications service provider or the same managed service provider, same software as a service provider as other entities who would be the topic of a geopolitical target? I think about the Las Vegas Sands Casino event, mm -hmm. which had geopolitical origins to it. Uh, and certainly the insurance community is looking at this very closely. Uh, the same way an insurer doesn't want to underwrite 50 houses on the same beach in a hurricane zone. They'd rather diversify their portfolio to different geographic areas so the same hurricane event won't compromise all their mm -hmm. investments their or whole portfolio. their whole portfolio. Well, think about virtual space. If you insure 20 companies who are all hosted on the same international telecommunications provider who becomes the target of a geopolitical conflict, that's the same as a single hurricane beach. But most people don't even know who their virtual neighbors are, right. let alone figure out how to mitigate it. They don't right. even have their own house shuttered up for the hurricane, let alone know who else is on their beach. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So when it comes to the idea, you mentioned like bakery or even you know, really small businesses, uh, many entrepreneurs and business owners are thinking you know, that, uh, well, my data is not that valuable. Uh, although we know that in the information age, data is you know, has, has been in the equivalent almost of, of gold or oil or the new, kind of the new oil. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that specifically? Um, and, and is it the new gold? Well, data is fascinating. I do believe data is an incredibly important commodity in the, the bulwark of the information economy, uh, which you compare it to their good political economy arguments for gold and Right. Right. Wonderful dialogues, I think, spurred by The Economist magazine a couple years back. Uh, most people don't appreciate how valuable their information is, number one, to their own organization. What is the real essence? I mean, think about a bank today. There may be brick-and-mortar ATMs, but at the end of the day, a modern bank is a data company. Right. It's a database. And the integrity and security and trustworthiness of that database is what's important. Right. Now, some of those banks who have trading arms, the communications link to where they do their high-speed trading is equally important, right? But it's about data. Uh, your customer list, even if you're a small retailer, is probably the equity value in your company. Your life's work and your proprietorship is the goodwill of your customers. You have a horrible breach of all their personal data. They may not be interested in coming and doing that transaction with you in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of groups also underestimate the value of their own information to others. To see that point, just look at the social media companies who are now worth billions of dollars based off of information that the private owners valued at basically nothing. Right. Right. If you want to see what that data is worth, it's in the facial recognition programs of all your family photos you've uploaded and that they are using to train their algorithms. Yes. Right. Even food companies, I, with all the, the food pictures and everyone makes a joke, well, who really cares? What harm is it? You know, even, even uh, you know, Nabisco and some of these others can, are able to use what people post in terms yeah. of what products to create. I mean, it Absolutely. really is the, the intelligence behind the data. And, and, and to, to even an earlier point, it's sometimes it's, it's what's not valuable to you, cyber criminals or, or different organizations 
understand that it's about the number that they're able to sell um, the, the and the types of information. The sheer aggregate information, uh, training the new AI systems is about the quantity and quality of data you can feed it. Uh, let's go back to that analogy to the gold or oil. Mm -hmm. uh, I've often said that I actually think data is like the new seawater. Okay. You're totally surrounded by it. 70% of Earth is covered in seawater. But it does you no good for your thirst or hydrating your body. Right. Can't until you, you yeah. yeah, until you exert a lot of energy to desalinate it or and purify it out of remove the contaminants, right? right? You gotta think about data that way. It's all around us, sensors and communications, it's multiplying data at exponential rates. But the companies and the governments who can figure out how to collect it, how to structure it, and how to leverage it are gonna have a dramatic comparative advantage over their competitors. And we've seen hacks over the years. You know, I was in government when the Office of Personnel Management hack happened. Right. We've seen airline passenger manifests for you know years worth of data stolen. We've seen healthcare subscribers stolen. Well, if you put on your intelligence thinking cap and you look at the different ways that these data sets can be combined or leveraged or compared, uh, I'm not the least bit surprised that certain foreign entities are taking huge tranches of seemingly irrelevant data. Right. Because when it's all put together, you get a wonderful view of American society and the population. You also get a wonderful view of the marketplace that you can leverage to your comparative advantage. And even extremely encrypted data, uh, as we've talked about in the mm -hmm. past, uh, can still be valuable, even if it's not valuable to them today. They still understand the value of mm -hmm. data uh, for you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, even if it's uh, you know, quantum computing or we're, we're yeah. further uh, technology is generated. Yeah, you've actually touched on two important points there. Uh, let's okay. take the latter one. Let's take the near future one first, Very right? Good. Those of you who follow quantum computing, you've probably heard the discussions that quantum computers, when they become more viable, will be able to decrypt the current encryption algorithms that are based on right. you know, Shor's algorithm, Shor's theorem, and uh, elliptical curve mathematics. Uh, that is likely, and you do have some entities, nation states out there, collecting currently encrypted communications for the day when they will be able to process them. Mm. I don't call that sci-fi, but I do think that's a few decades off. Okay. Uh, but even before you have that chance of decrypting it, even the metadata, right? Even knowing these two devices communicated, or here's the pattern and flux of data over time within a network or between networks, mm -hmm. can be valuable data in itself. Uh, won't speak about particular cases, but I can certainly say in the intelligence community, you've heard leaders of NSA and other places talk about the value of metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't be investing time and money in that if there wasn't value to it. And I would offer that many other governments and companies are doing the same. So the metadata, and then in the future, the ability to actually open up those cryptographic yeah, blocks. Yeah, the, the quantum. Yeah, I, I know that, uh, you know, as it relates to to uh, the the business person, the we're talking about the encrypted data, you know, stolen and what have you, but um, but how does this impact the, the corporate strategy? Specifically, uh, you know, the, the biggest expenses are usually payroll and salary, yep. so you got people. Um, and then my CapEx expenditures are always, you know, a, a source of uh, discussion and debate every year. So, so when it comes to the, the people and, and really the technology component, and uh, how does cybersecurity, um, let me ask it this way. So when, whenever I was a, a senior director at Choice Point, we were the first to go public with a data breach. Uh, we, we, we had 125,000 records compromised and no one actually breached the system it was a social engineering. They had, they had actually previously stolen the actual credentials, and then it passed all of our security checks. Okay, so that's that's how that happened. But then, you know, I had fifteen hundred employees that um, there we had to change their behavior substantially after that. Now that resulted in my mind. I'm thinking that resulted in a lot of uh, decreased production and productivity. And I was not on the cybersecurity train at that time. I saw it as an impediment to revenue and, and decreased productivity. So obviously when you're having to change the behavior of 1500 employees, uh, how, and of course I, I see now how, how that actually helps in, in sports revenue, but how does this cybersecurity really integrate in a business in a way that supports the, the objectives, which is obviously usually profit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any modern enterprise today is going to be online, linked, engaged in multiple ways. They're going to be using IT to pursue their business objectives through the use of data. The Internet of Things. I mean, it's here. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right yeah. 
And it's that combination of people, processes, and technology that determine how well defended you are and how functionally profitable you can be, right? You think of an e-commerce site or financial institution. Well, if they're not well protected and they suffer a denial of service or a ransomware attack, that's going to directly take them offline and put a separation between them and their customers, mm -hmm. right? Or between them and their clients who want to be accessing the internet banking portals, right? We've seen that experience from the Iranian actors in 2012, 2013 in the U.S. who temporarily uh, disrupted some U.S. financial institutions. And trust plummeted uh, uh, with, yeah, between, it, between the consumer and the yeah, financial institution, and the, between the business and the customer. Yeah, and one of the issues there was it was almost a systemic issue. You know, multiple institutions were harmed in that way. So the question became, you know, where's the public confidence in the system? Now, we successfully retained it, and we didn't have mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a crisis, a run of the banks or anything. Right. But we have to be looking at these as concerns going forward and thinking about that nexus between the people, the processes, and the technology. Uh, social engineering. I can think of so many uh, cyber attacks that were facilitated by a human element, yes. either a external malicious actor or an unwitting internal actor who opened the email because it came. It looked like it was coming from their boss, and right. you know the the best email attachment to get people open is you know holiday bonuses, right? <laughs> Everyone's going to open that attachment, or the rush assignment from your CEO. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and the social engineers are just getting better and better. It's termed spear phishing, right? Uh, so to think about maximizing the profitability of enterprise, this has to be a part of your corporate strategy and understanding. It starts with an assessment of where your value is. Mm -hmm. I think back to the Saudi Aramco case where they had a major corporate breach that ended up destroying about 30,000 of their corporate PCs, but it didn't migrate and affect their petroleum drilling, extraction, and transport mechanism. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're Saudi Aramco, world dominant uh, petroleum company, that's your lifeblood, right? right? So every C-suite needs to start with asking, where is the essence of our value? There are things that are essential to continuing as a business, mm -hmm. and there are other things that are nice to have. Right. Um, there's one UK tech company that used to actually be an incubator for other technology startups, and it's quite sad, a few years ago, they went out of business in a matter of about four hours. Mm. They were compromised with a ransomware. They weren't able to address that situation before their backups were compromised. And you actually look at their Twitter feed, their corporate Twitter feed, and it started with, please bear with us, we're having some technical difficulties, to before the end of the day, we regret to inform you we'll no longer be able to continue operations. We will do our best to apply restitution to our clients who have suffered as a result of this. Wow. They closed their door. An internet company who theoretically should be knowing about these things. Right. right. Well, it brings me, though, to, to another topic, which is really on legacy systems. Because you talked about, you know, when, when, when your system is attacked and then even when your backup systems are, are compromised. Um, and one of the things that nearly every company that I've gone in required some element of, of up grading the the software that our employees use making us more because because the you know in business school and you know this in, from grad school and they go uh it's a, about efficiency it's about optimizing yeah. you know and and so i'm going in and i'm trying to say what's the how do i increase productivity 10 percent or you know or, or or you know dramatically more but you know, i'm trying to to consolidate i'm trying to streamline and, and make us more efficient um because many of them are using legacy systems. What does a company do that uh, has legacy databases or what have you that they're using? Sometimes they started, you know, 25 years ago, right, in, in, in database. So, yeah, a few thoughts come to mind. I mean, first, I'd say I think there are new developments in cybersecurity that people should be embracing. Uh, for starters, the average small or medium business uh, will not be able to put in the level of investment in storage or protection that the major cloud providers were. So mm -hmm. unless you are a very large entity, I'd probably be encouraging you to consider the cloud. <laughs> uh, a lot of organizations won't have the ability to fund their own proprietary cloud. Uh, but at the same time, you have that old adage of, you know, why, why do people rob banks? It's because that's where all the money is, right? Mm -hmm. As we put all that data, which you've already said is the valuable asset, mm -hmm. into a finite number of major cloud providers, everyone who's looking to compromise that, the foreign nation states, the criminals, uh, 
your business competitors, if they're operating illegally, are all going to the same place, and it becomes that offense, defense, cat and mouse game. Right. And well, and for those who who think that it can't happen to you, uh, it happened to Microsoft with a nation state, uh, North Korea. Yeah, it's happened you know, to all of them. Yeah, everyone. It, exactly. No yeah, one is so immune from this. That's uh, the key. I'm not going to pick on anyone, yeah. but companies who have publicly uh, announced their own right. breaches drastically. We've heard about Microsoft. We've heard about J.P. Morgan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Android heard, 600 million last week. Yeah. We've heard about government organizations right. ranging from the Office of Personnel Management, <laughs> DOD. Numerous universities. Uh, yeah. Many, many universities. Premier law firms, investment banks, right? Yes. No one's immune to this. In fact, if anyone tells you that they have never been compromised, that's probably a bad sign because it means they haven't yet figured out that they were <laughs> right. they've been compromised. They have and they don't know it. What you want to know is, hey, here's where I was compromised and here's what I've done about it to remediate that and here's what I'm doing to prevent a similar thing and other things in the future. That's, again, where Exodec helps to hope, uh, hopes to help you is what is the next generation of attack, right? We need mm-hmm. people helping clean up last week's mess. Mm-hmm. You also need people telling you where next week's and next year's mess is going to be. Mm-hmm. And that's where we try to provide a fair advantage. But I want to go back to one thing you said. Uh, it's a f- funny point about the legacy systems, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, you still do have major elements of the infrastructure that operate on networks that were built years ago and include hardware and software programs and uh, hardware devices right. that might be considered antiquated. Now, in certain elements, that's actually provided a degree of what we in the government used to call security by obscurity, <laughs> right. because it's actually difficult today to go out and buy a COBOL or a Fortran programming book. So if you had certain mainframes that are still in use for financial clearing systems or something, that may actually be a little tougher for a modern criminal to target, mm-hmm. because that's not being taught the way it used to be. Uh, it's also relevant where you can't maybe buy that book translated into certain languages that political extremists or criminals might right. be more, uh, there would not be their first language. Right. So I'm not advocating everyone to, you know, live in the 1980s, but uh, it has been interesting a couple places where certain attacks were attempted and they were unsuccessful because, because how antiquated. the younger perpetrators weren't familiar with some of the older architectures. Well, and I think that's But I advocate moving to the cloud. Right, yeah, that's what you're saying. You, you clearly... But and the key, like any good expert, though, is to know where you can and where you should and where you should not. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what, where, what do you leave legacy? What do you upgrade? And, you know, thinking about the viewers of the boardroom series, mm-hmm. there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Right. right. Remember, you have to think like the perpetrator to know how to be a good defender. Yes. You also have to think about the nature of cyber attacks. Uh, excuse the somewhat military analogy, but a 9 millimeter bullet will do the same thing to every human body, right? The same piece of malware will not have the same effect on all different kinds of corporate networks. It depends on the equipment you're running, the software you're running, how you've engineered the system and connected the devices. So if I were going to run an offensive operation, and let's hope people out there only do it in defense of national security right, and right. public interest yeah. or law enforcement investigations, but there's usually an initial phase where you're doing research and investigation to acquire the targeting data you need to run a successful op that does only what you want it to do, does what you want it to, and only what you want it to do, right? right? Not harming additionals. Right. Uh, and then you actually go proceed with the activity. That first phase is essential to knowing what you're going to get. Mm. The, a lot of the problem we see in today's world is people don't realize what's going to happen when they release a piece of malware. They either get less than they wanted or more than they wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they mask it as one activity when it's there. Wanna cry, not Petio, were allegedly ma- ransomware. Well, no, they weren't. They were state-sponsored activities for other political purposes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And that's mm-hmm. why it's a part of your corporate strategy. It's about the return on your investment. Because as you said, it's an expenditure. It is. Right? Yes. But what percentage of your annual revenue are you willing to spend to ensure your enterprise value, your customer's goodwill? I think back to 2014, 2015, and again, I'll go to J.P. Morgan, because mm-hmm. Jamie Dimon has been very vocal on this, and they've put large investments into it, and they also acknowledged their compromise in 2014 mm-hmm. uh, by criminal elements. Uh, at that point, I believe at the, tw- at the end of 2014, J.P. Morgan was spending about 0.1% of its market cap and 1% of its annual revenues on cybersecurity. And if they were able to spend that amount and be effective or as good as their competitors, that's an incredibly cheap amount right. to keep your business profitable. Right. Now, I think about the levels the check fraud cost banks in the 70s, right? We were up to 2 and 3% of revenues, mm-hmm. right? 
Uh, you got to figure out what the right level is. There's no one size fits all solution. Mm -hmm. But you also have to understand that just because you are a local retailer doesn't mean you can't be the victim of systemic things, collateral damage or business competition. Right. Right. And, and, it, and it never stops. You, this, you can solve one problem. And I think in cybersecurity, especially in the last couple of years, as more CSOs and, and others, the C-suite recognize the need for cybersecurity software, they did start investing a little bit more, but it was product focused. So it was to, to a point that you made, um, I block you from here and you can't get in here. And then I have to buy another solution to block um, in, with this technology uh, based on what you may try to throw out. So there's the, the you know, and instead of just being a product focused cybersecurity solution, you also have to have a more comprehensive solution oriented yeah. that looks at the entire framework, the entire architecture, uh, you know, to prevent the attacks. And, and I think there are really three big developments here. You have the regulatory frameworks, which mm -hmm. are requiring more. I think about the SEC guidelines in the U.S. and the rules in other countries. Uh, you have the liability issue now for directors and officers, which mm -hmm. makes it personal. Yes, very. Uh, that's meant to be an intentional incentive on oh, yes. those of you running companies. Yes. Uh, and then there is the legislative side. I think about the GDPR, General Data Privacy Regulation in the EU. I think about the new CCPA uh, Act out of California, which just took effect. And these are issues where you may not ordinarily ask where all your customers are coming from in the digital ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But you are now held accountable extraterritorially to foreign jurisdiction legal requirements. And if you are not compliant, you can be subject to very substantial uh, financial fines or other ramifications. Right. So there's part of the problem of if you don't know what you don't know. Well, there are folks out there who do know and are willing to help you mm -hmm. and figure out what is necessary or not necessary. Uh, I do a lot of work with the insurance industry. And like any good company, once you realize there's risk that you can manage by training your personnel, having a corporate compliance policy, uh, that's all important. But if you realize something, geopolitical risk halfway around the world is something that you can't manage or have any impact on, well, then you try to hedge it. Right. In many cases, that's a cyber insurance policy. What's the right level of protection? Uh, what things you need to be protected and insured against? That's all a point for discussion. But that's a part of your business strategy. Right. Well, and you and Exodec are my one of my risk management <laughs> strategies. So I think that's that's important to have. Just like anything else, you you, you assemble a team. Right. Yeah. As a leader, it's all about you know having the best team and having the team that can work together. You, I want to have the best CFO. I want to have that understands our business and works with us. The, the chief business officer, the sales officers, you know, the operations. You, you want to have all of these areas in line and working together. And so I think that this is the the, the other component that has to be you know in the room. Yeah, and and I also appreciate that not every company is a multi billion dollar cap company. Right. Uh, they will need to outsource some of these some of this assistance rather than having everyone on their home payroll. Right. Right. There are auditors you want. There are companies like mine you will want to yes. be helping you. There are Which is cheaper than hiring someone like you at, at a seven or eight figure price tag. To be right? in your office every day. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, exactly. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and there are IT solutions, you know, hardware and software solutions you will want to be purchasing. But to figure out that right uh, grouping is important. And especially as there are increasing expectations from regulators and customers about what you're going to do. Uh, I think about how Sarbanes-Oxley developed to govern corporate governance, right? right? And SBI. And We're seeing that in process of being formulated. You look at some of the draft legislation. You look at some of the other things government regulators around the world are considering. We're going that direction in cyber. Uh, it's already very strongly advised for any board to have one of their independent directors knowledgeable in cyber if they don't have one of their executive yes. directors in there. Uh, among other things, Exodec offers that service. You know, we a lot of us serve on boards right. of venture capital groups or some of their portfolio companies. Uh, well, it helps that that you have a background too in in, in legal, uh, a strong legal background in terms of professional training and and um, and then just kind of the, the the intersection of of regulation, legal. You understand commercial viability, and yeah. you know you can't stop doing business in yeah. order to be secure. Uh, so really just how all of this, and even AI, and, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about much as it relates to security is, is deterrence. It's one thing to, um, you know, to defend. It's another thing to deter. I want to 
disincentivize you from even trying to attack me or to hack into my company. Yeah, so uh, I, I will presume everyone hasn't spent a long time reading my resume. You refer to, <laughs> I started my career on Wall Street with the doing mergers and acquisitions and banking law for, uh, I'll plug them because I feel very fond of them, Skadden Arps Law Firm, uh, some of you may know it. Uh, and so I started as an international lawyer in okay. the corporate realm. And I've continued that focus on that nexus between law, technology, and security, mm. right? And looking at how it plays out. That's one of the things that allows us to advise clients on future geopolitical implications. I mean, right. you can clearly see the overlap with my yeah. career What's legal here may be illegal somewhere else or vice versa. and can get a company yeah. or an individual. A absolutely. Yeah. And then you look about wanting to enter into different markets, right? What's required to be a viable entry into this market? Do they have data localization laws that will require me to purchase and implant a whole new data center within their nation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do they have extraterritorial rules if I'm selling products or collecting the personal information of, for example, a European citizen, even if I'm a company in Idaho, mm -hmm. right? Uh, GDPR has global reach. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking at that nexus is really important and understanding the legal topography as well as the legal considerations that are being discussed in the political circles are really important because this is about being ahead of the game. So let's talk about one of those. Um, you know, what is there, are, are there offensive strategies that companies can deploy, uh, you know, that you can help guide through with, let's say, a hackback store <laughs> or, or, or somehow whenever the, the, the deterrent side of it to where if you do this, just know uh, it doesn't stop there. And I know that, you know, we, we kind of touched on before, there's, there's, um, there's two aspects to that because on one hand, it's very helpful to know how, what, who it is and why they're doing it and, how they're, and what they're doing to your system. And if you respond, then you just told that, you know, cyber criminal, which, you know, is almost like an entrepreneur who's just going to not stop until they get in. Uh, and so you just told them, nope, don't try this way. Try another 10 ways. Yeah. Uh, so what, you know, are there ways that you can be more uh, on offense in the cyber response? So that is a very popular question, and there are a lot of companies out there who want to be able to do that. There are a lot of service providers and cyber forensics companies who could technically provide that skill. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in the United States, that is currently not happening, and it's ill-advised uh, by most general counsels because it would be illegal. It would be a criminal activity under Title 18, Section 1030, our Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, that said, uh, are there certain entities that have done those things around the world? Yes, mm -hmm. but they're really operating in the criminal space uh, mm -hmm. because they are violating laws by hacking back. Mm -hmm. Now, there are things short of act an actual hack back where you disrupt the other system or the other person's data, mm -hmm. where you can try to beacon your data or watermark your data, mm -hmm. but those then do not have a deleterious effect on the other end. Right. So hack back, I would actually advise everyone not to do, especially if you're in the U.S. because it is illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, I instead argue that you have to have a business strategy to protect your greatest assets and resources, to have a good holistic defensive approach that encompasses people, processes, and technology. And I tend to like to refer to it, uh, we try to make our clients the fastest three-legged gazelles out there. <laughs> no one is going to be perfectly safe and secure in the space. Offense has the advantage over defense technologically, at least for the time being. But you want to protect yourself as well as you can, which can be a very high level. But even more important than your absolute level of security is your relative level of security. Mm. Because unless you actually are the target of a specific rogue state, or if, unless you are injecting yourself into a specific international conflict, the odds are you won't be a direct target. Now, you might be collateral damage or something else right. like we discussed before, but there's an opportunism to this, especially when you come to the criminal enterprises. It's just like someone walking down the street looking at which house they want to break into. Are they going to break into the house with all the security system, bell and whistles? Are they going to break into the house with the American flag and the U.S. Marine Corps flag right. and someone in the no. door holding a shotgun? Or are they going to go a little further down the street, right. right? We can help you be that least desirable target. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges, and this is a broad cybersecurity and really goes outside of it a little bit, but uh, I think it's relevant, and that is uh, is – disinformation campaigns uh, as it relates to business. And it's, it's almost an age old kind of a, a thing, uh, but like the game of telephone, you know, yeah. if I tell you by the time it gets around, you know, it's completely different. And, and, and really disinformation, 
but but the reason why it's so pertinent is because information can travel so much faster today because of social media. So what what are some thoughts, especially because I think that's one of the greatest challenges that businesses face today, um, and, and and even the the biggest boys on the block uh, have a series of responses that they automatically deploy whenever something negative starts to go viral on social media, even if it's whether it's true or not true, they don't spend their cycles trying to respond in, in, to the disinformation. So what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on, yeah. on this? Well, first of all, you know, a, a lot of the popular discussion on the disinformation issue is election related. Yes. Uh, yeah. We certainly all hear about that. Right. But we want to focus here on the commercial side of it because it is incredibly prevalent in the commercial competition space too. Right. Uh, it is not new. Disinformation, business intelligence. Yeah. This has been going on for years, just in other media. Yeah, I think they're going out of business. I'm not sure though. I'm not sure, but they, I, I heard that yeah. they might be. No, no, or yeah. they won't be able to fulfill the orders. Right, right, right. Uh, no. Yeah. And what it really comes down to is this difference between quantity and quality. And bear with me for a second, right? Yeah. If I show you one neon light bulb, it's scientifically interesting how it luminesces. If I put 10 in the window of a bar or a tarot, tarot card reading store, it's a nice little sign, right? Mm -hmm. But when I put millions upon millions of them together on the Las Vegas Strip in Times Square or in Akihabara in Japan, it is a completely different experience and impact. The changes in the scale and scope of data transmission, data repli replication, and the opportunities for misinformation, disinformation, that change in quantity has actually taken on a qualitative impact, which means the game has changed. And the most important issue, uh, you know, the first bit of advice I would give to anyone and really getting into what a corporate action plan would look like would take much more time than some of the right, things we right. do provide. But the first thing is, if you do not have that in place, you will fail the day you encounter that disinformation campaign. This is not something you can respond to on the fly. You talked about the folks who are prepared for it, right? They have their own strategy that they use. It's not just about blocking your opponent at each point. Right. It's about taking control of that dialogue, maintaining your brand reputation, ensuring that your suppliers and your purchasers don't start failing on those contracts because they believe you're going to breach, right? Mm -hmm. It is about knowing how to respond to your – and not just to the external audience, but also to your own employees, What's happening, mm. right? There's trust on both sides, mm -hmm. internal yes. and external. So this is a really important point. Can't solve it here in our one-hour right. session together. But I'd say the you know the one freebie tip is you got to start thinking about this long before you are the target or the incidental victim of any of this. Otherwise, you will fail. And and one of the things that we've said, it's not a matter of if. It's when. probably not even a matter of when. It's you already have been. But from here on, let's be smarter about it. Yeah, or how much? Yeah, and yeah, can exactly. you mitigate it? Can you manage it? Again, I often don't talk about cybersecurity because that makes one think it could be perfective. Mm. I talk about information risk and information risk management. Right. Even if you know you can't be perfect, how good can you be and can you be significantly better than your competition? Yeah, very good. Well, Sean, thanks again for joining us today. We've My been pleasure. talking about emerging cybersecurity technology and uh, how it impacts corporate strategy. And so we're glad that you've been able to join us on this edition of the Boardroom Series. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Boardroom Series sponsored by Exodec International. We enjoyed having you this evening and look forward to seeing you in the future. If you would like to continue the conversation with us, please join us at exodec.net. My name is Matthew Canuck, Chief Marketing Officer for Exodec International, and I invite you to join us for our next episode where Professor Brendan Purcell joins Dr. Roland Roberts to discuss the business implications of artificial intelligence. We'll see you then.